Hi everyone, my name's Terence. I've done quite a lot of videos in the past um, related to the, the Facebook page Cop This um, or via the Cop This YouTube channel. Uh, those videos were, were done a little while back. Um, Lee actually approached me um, the other day and asked, uh, basically put, put an idea to me to start audio podcasts. Um, it's something that I obviously have that I've not Done myself before but it's something that I was very very open to and open to the idea of, uh, of doing um, so yeah so we've, we've decided to sort of give it a bit of a trial and start here um, some of the things that we are wanting really to talk to you about or to talk to, to sort of talk to everyone about tonight is the game first and foremost um, our player rating first and foremost. Klopp has uh, very much at his disposal. Um, that there's still quite a lot of uncertainty almost um, over what our midfield best three is. Um, so, so that's uh, you know that's a sort of uh, a bit of a spark for a debate there. Um, and also looking further forward to an Everton preview, um, obviously playing playing our um, Merseyside rivals on Sunday at quarter past four. So also wanted really to, to, sort of to discuss that a little bit and um, to, to gain your views as well and to sort of seek what other people, what other people are thinking um, and, you know, and, and take it from there. Yeah, so I'm Lee. I've been on the page for, I think, around three years or something like that. I'm a Liverpool fan. Unfortunately, I'm from the bad place, which is Manchester which is, I can't swear on the podcast, but you know what I mean. Uh, so yeah, that's all you really need to know about me. You, 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 uh, there'll, there'll be times where there's frustrating performances, uh, bad performances, obviously losses. You, you'll find some, uh, you'll get some uh, very uh, colourful language uh, from me. So I, I can certainly uh, not, not really promise to, uh, to, to not swear. Um, on, on the podcast, um, I don't swear an, an awful lot, but you know, you never, you never know. You know, hopefully, if we keep, you know, if we perform like we did tonight uh, in every match for the rest of the season, then I'll have no reason to swear apart from excitement. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be an up and down rest of the season. It's going to be a very up and down rest of the season. It's essentially ten cup finals that obviously that we've that we have left in the Premier League. Yeah, and the Champions League games, which I think we can beat Bayern away if we can score away. We, we've certainly we've certainly got the ammunition to score. Um, obviously, the last couple of games prior to this uh, this match this evening uh, against Watford, uh, obviously against away at Old Trafford against United, and then obviously at home versus uh, Bayern Munich, we had a, a couple of obviously nil nils stalemates. Um, I, I can't really remember the last time that I've seen Liverpool involved in two nil-nil draws um, in succession. It feels like we've been treated that much really over the last sort of three years, obviously with Jurgen Klopp being in charge and obviously with Brendan Rodgers as well. In, in the Brendan Rodgers era, we were sort of, we were free-flowing, but we were just shambolic at the back. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, 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 uh, we, we've certainly got the firepower to uh, to score against Bayern. Um, if, with a performance like that this evening, I don't see any reason why we won't score um, in Germany. And I believe that, that you know, obviously, uh, obviously we know that a, a score draw would take us through anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I, I gen genuinely can't really sort of see us not scoring um, in Germany. Yeah. All right, I'm going to end the, you know, first section now. Okay, okay. Okay, so now we're going to go on to talk about the game this evening. Uh, obviously, we were at home at uh, Anfield against Watford. Um, and what a performance the boys had. Um, obviously, we won 5-0. Um, and, and, well, what a performance, really. That's that's about the first thing that you can say, is, is, is literally what, what a performance. Yeah. We started really, really well and 
Trent Alexander Arnold, I think I think he's under talk. It's about you know his young players go. Yeah. And yeah, just any five nil victory is good at home, even if yeah, Watford were under good form as well coming into this game. And I thought maybe they'd try and stop us scoring, but we were on farm today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, well, Watford, I, I think they, they were on quite a ridiculous form, really, weren't they, coming into it, weren't they? I, I, I'm pretty certain that I, I sort of read uh, somewhere that they'd lost one of the last 11 or something like that. that they, were, they were on a good run, uh, Watford. They, was, they were certainly on a very, very decent run. That could be inaccurate, obviously, what I've just said there, but I, I know that they, they certainly sort of had a, a fair few performances, a fair few matches in the league where they, they had gone unbeaten. Um, Watford obviously are, are no pushovers anyway um, but yet obviously when they seem to, to rock up to Anfield they seem to get um, put away uh, thankfully for us quite quite easily um, the last three matches that Watford have had at Anfield they've uh, conceded a total of 16 goals um, obviously they conceded five in this match um, I know that they were, they were beaten 6-0 at Anfield obviously last season but, um, but no what a performance and you mentioned obviously Trent I think that Trent is, um, you know, he, he's an invaluable, invaluable asset and probably one of the best. Um, I don't think it's sort of overstating it. He's possibly one of the very best um, young right backs in the world uh, right now. Um, his crossing ability, crossing delivery is so on point. It's um, very, 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 very good uh, crossing ability uh, as Trent. Um, also, I think uh, the actual overall play tonight was much more like what we expect from this Liverpool side. It was frighteningly quick, um, really, really, really high tempo, fast paced right from the off. Um, Watford just didn't really know what to do with us. They didn't know how to handle us. Um, and I think also I just want to get out there now, uh, whilst I'm thinking about it, Mo Salah, um, it seems to me to be much more effective on that right-hand side. Obviously, he was deployed on the right-hand side tonight uh, instead of central, like he's played for a lot of games for us this season. And um, he appears much more effective. Um, you know, he really, really gave the Watford defence um, a, a torrid time this evening. Um, I can't actually think now of, um, of the left-back's name for Watford. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. But he, he gave him an absolute torrid time um, tonight. So I'm just thinking sort of moving forward, hopefully that Mo Salah will be kept on the right side um, in attack. Yeah, it's interesting to see how Klopp uh, set up with, against Watford because uh, obviously Firmino got that injury and Deva Karigi was a sort of odd selection. Some people thought he might have gone with uh, Shakira. I did. Yeah, yeah I, I, did. I especially did as well. But he went with Origi and he got a goal and he played a pretty all right game for someone who's probably only started around two games a season. Do you know he did? He did. He did. Um, actually, Divock Origi, to be honest, he, he proved me wrong to a certain extent this evening. Um, I'm not going to lie. I want to be quite upfront and honest because obviously hindsight's a funny thing and all that as well. But obviously when um, when the team selection was announced, I was fuming. Um, I, I really was. And, and obviously I, I always, I, I back any side, obviously, that, that Jurgen Klopp puts out. At the end of the day, obviously, it's the manager that I, that I trust um, and he knows best. But when I saw the starting eleven, I, I was very, very sceptical for, for not just for the Divo Carigi uh, inclusion, obviously, in Firmino's absence, but also James Milner's inclusion. Um, I did think that there would be a, a real lack of creativity in the midfield. And then obviously, Origi, of course, up front, I thought, you know, what on earth are we doing? Um, obviously, we're at home. We're playing Watford. You know, I thought the team is not attacking enough. There's not enough creativity. But obviously, I, I, I'm very happy to admit that I was very, very wrong. Um, Divock, uh, I think, like you said, he, he sort of has one or two starts a season. Um, he's very lucky, really, to get more than that. Or, or you could say unlucky. But obviously, when you've got the likes of Salah, Mane and obviously Firmino, um, you know, they're going to keep basically anybody out of the team 
um, obviously in, in terms of obviously being up front. And we're quite lucky so far in terms of injuries to our forward players. Um, it's, it's been defensively that we've had the sort of the injury crisis and still obviously waiting for Joe Gomez to come back. Uh, that can't happen soon enough still. Although, although again, Matip, Matip hasn't exactly done too badly in the last few games. I know that when he first came in, um, he, he was quite shaky. Um, and, I, and I started to, you know, we, we started to concede more goals um, at the end of December January, obviously beginning of January, uh, and then through January, we, we sort of conceded a lot more goals than we had done in the in the several months, the four months leading up to that. Um, yeah. So that was just obviously indicative, weren't it, really, of our of our defensive issues? But no, anyway, getting back onto topic, obviously very quickly with the, with Divock, he he did he had a good good game. Um, I think for the first half he was largely anonymous. You know, he he wasn't he wasn't too sort of involved with the build up as such. Um, and, uh, and obviously uh, a threat as such. But in the second half, um, no, I think he, he, he played well. He, he deserved his goal um, in the second half. Uh, I mean, it was crowded out by two or three Watford players um, in the build-up to that goal, um, obviously before scoring. And uh, no, no, it was, I was going to say, very, very, very good, um, Divock. Um, obviously, he's an able backup, but I would personally say that uh, I still feel that Outside of the front three, obviously Mane, Salah and Firmino, we don't have enough going forward. Obviously, strikers are striking, uh, obviously forward play. We, I don't believe that if, the, you know, if, we, if we suffered a real serious injury to any of the front three, I think we would be struggling goal-wise in, you know, in the long term. Yeah, I do agree because uh, we was going to sign Nabil Fakir and apparently a history of his knee sort of stopped us from signing him uh, and we didn't really go in for anyone else he was going to be our you know major summer signer I think it was like 75 million we were going to buy him for and we ended up not going for anyone else and I feel maybe you should have done because I don't think storage because he's not played a game he's not going to be match fit even if we ever had to throw him in the deep end like if just I'm touching wood. If Salah got injured and Mane, we would have had to throw either Sturridge or Lallana, who's had very long-term injuries. Lallana's been very unlucky with his injuries. And we couldn't, I don't if, think if we could rely on him. Yeah, I was just going to say there, sorry, sorry to, 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 to interrupt. I was just going to say, you could you could almost say the same for both, really. Obviously for Lallana and obviously uh, Daniel Sturridge, they're both sort of... Um, you know, made of paper. Um, they, they, they both had quite a lot of injuries, um, obviously, throughout their careers. Uh, Daniel Sturridge seems to sort of come back from injury as well. And then um, he can sort of play one one or two games and, and again, find himself injured and, and has done, obviously, in the past. Um, it's funny, speaking of Adam Lalana, Jurgen Klopp obviously still seems to really like um, Adam. Um and, you know, it's 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 funny because you go back, obviously, to what two seasons ago. Now, once it would be it would be two seasons ago, and obviously, Lalana was very much um, a mainstay in in Klopp's side. Um, if you, if you you know you go back and you look at the teams that that were fielded by Klopp two seasons ago, um, Lalana was very very much sort of at the for, forefront of that. Yeah. And I've, I noticed that he was brought on again tonight. Um, I, I it's funny. Adam Lallana is always one player that I've actually really liked, um, and that 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 is quite controversial because, you know, you you certainly see on Twitter. I, I noticed tonight, lots of fans, you know, criticising, asking why on earth Lallana was being brought on. People saying, you know, that, that that basically that Klopp was, you know, was bonkers with his substitutions, but yeah, you know, Klopp clearly rates him still and clearly likes him. Um, and, and, and again, I think that, it, that it's his judgment. You know, if he believes that Adam Lallana obviously should be coming off the bench, he should be, should be obviously, you know, coming into the side, then that's his call. Um, I, don't, I don't think that makes him bonkers or anything else like that, like, like people like to, you know, sort of throw out on Twitter. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel um, I feel when he does play, when he starts, because I think, Klopp knows as well as we do the midfield dilemma. Uh, Lalana does when he's when he's on, he gives it a all. He sprints for every ball, and 
I sort of sometimes think to myself, how is he still running after like 30 minutes of him constantly running up and down the pitch, pressing the ball? Oh, I do. I'd be dead. I'd be dead after five, let yeah. alone after 30. Uh, yeah. running, running like Adam Lallana. He's, uh, he, he is, he, he's like a terrier, isn't he, really? He's like a terrier in, in football terms. Um, he, you know, he, he he chases every cause, lost causes. He, you know, he hustles and harries uh, around. Obviously, I think that he gets a lot of sort of mockery from from some Liverpool fans um, for his Cruyff turns um, and things like that. Um, he, he seems to get quite a lot of hate for 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 it for sort of the showboating and the, you know that that's that sort of side of his game. But I think that's sort of, that's the personality uh, of Adam Lallana and and just his general game style. Um, so, so he, he, I think he, he gets a bit of a raw deal uh, with, with some fans, but of course there's still no escaping the fact that he's made a paper. Uh, he's very, very fragile. Um, there's no consistency uh, in terms of being able to have him, you know, frequently available for for the side. Um, yeah. I, I do think if, if he'd have stayed fit, you know, from two seasons ago, I think he'd have, had he have stayed fit, I, I still feel like he would have been quite a regular in Klopp's team because I feel that Jurgen Klopp does like him. You know what I mean? So I, I, I feel like he would have certainly got a lot more games had he have stayed fit. Yeah, most definitely. I think he, um, to replace Alana knowing he is made of paper, he did make the signing of uh, Chamberlain and operated him more in midfield, which I didn't get why Arsenal didn't because I think Chamberlain's best games when he played a central midfield and now we have that option he's sort of a ball carrier yeah definitely definitely now it's it's funny obviously on the the topic of course of Ox obviously of Alex Oxlade Chamberlain when we signed him um obviously we signed him um lot last summer god it was two years ago now wasn't it yeah. nearly two years ago that's right, isn't it? Yeah, we didn't sign him last summer. We signed him the summer before. I'm thinking he's had a long spell out, hasn't he? He's had basically most of this season out. That's why I'm thinking it was last summer. No, yeah, it was uh, two summers ago, obviously, this summer. Um, when we signed Alex, I was going to say, I, I openly admit I'm, I'm one of the first to sort of, sort of hold my hands up and say I wasn't happy. Um, I, I wasn't happy when we signed Ox at all. Um, I thought that he was okay at Arsenal. I thought he was nothing more than that. I didn't think he was yeah. a spectacular player. Um, I thought he was average. Um, I personally, at the time, was saying I would have preferred Jack Wilshere. I would have preferred sort of you know Aaron Ramsey. Um, I was not at all drawn to to Alex Oxlade Chamberlain. But then he became a pivotal, you know, a pivotal, a key midfield man for us last season. Um, obviously, I remember in particular that the one goal that stands out for me was the, the goal he scored against Manchester City, uh, obviously in the Champions League. Um, yeah. But, he, you know, he, he really, really did turn in some very, very good dominant midfield maestro performances, really. Um, and I think we've sorely missed him for a lot of a lot of this season. Um, yeah. It feels like we've been waiting for such a long time. And it, I think is it is it in the next week or two that he's supposed to be back? I'm, I'm sure I read it was like early March. He's, yeah, he's basically... he's, he started like training. I think two weeks ago. I also do think he tried to sign uh, Naby Keita to sort of soften the blow of losing Chamberlain. And while he's starting to put in okay performances, I think he needs to add goals or assists to his game. I totally totally agree. Um, Again, I'll, I'll be quite upfront, quite open with uh, about Naby Keita. Um, I've been, I, I would say I've possibly been quite a harsh critic. Um, I've not been very satisfied with a lot of his performances. And whilst I understand that it does take time to adjust to playing in a new league and obviously playing to the pace of the Premier League, um, uh, some of his performances, I think I can only describe, um, certainly in the past, as, as having been very, very lacklustre and almost careless. Um, the number of times that I've seen him, um, I, I'm trying to think now of which game I'm thinking of in particular. There was an example um, that, I, that I had in my head, but it's, it's, it's gone. But in, there's been many games that, that Keita's played and he has given possession away 
um, to the opposition that has led to, you know, uh, an attack and almost goal um, to the point where it's sort of, you know, close to close to our penalty box um, or it's basically just in front of our defenders. Um, and he's it, given the ball away carelessly. We're not really pressurised as such. Um, and, and like I say, it's led to an attack for the opposition that's almost resulted in a goal or has led to shots on target. Um, obviously, you look at obviously Keita, I know obviously he's an attacking midfielder, uh, and Fabinho obviously is a defensive midfielder, so it's perhaps un unfair for me to compare the two. But I think it's just more the, the, the fact where, where I'm getting at, what I'm trying to, to sort of say that you've got Fabinho throwing and, you know, Tim Fielder can still tackle. You know, any player pitch can still tackle. And it's the fact that I, I think that Naby has just too often for me shied away from tackles. He's sort of gone missing um, and, and has either led to the breakdown of our attacks or has led to sort of cost, you know, giving up possession in, in some really stupid areas. So now we'll talk about the our match ratings for the game against Watford. Okay. Uh, so how I would rate Allison a six point five. I don't think he had much to do, but he made that crucial save. I think it was against Gray where they avoided our high line from a uh, sort of a free kick. It was headed out and then put back in. Yeah. And he made a wonderful save with his hip to put it over the bar and I think he's been very crucial to us this season I think he saved us from having a very nervy last 20 minutes in the game he, he certainly did he certainly did his authority I think Allison's authority um, in goal is such a you know massive massive contrast to sort of you know Simon Mignolet and Loris Karius uh, of last season um, yeah, when, when you think about it, he's really, really, I think, alongside, of course, Van Dijk, he's transformed um, our sort of defensive side of our game, really, hasn't he? Um, yeah. We, you know, we, we have, I, I would say that you could have total confidence in Alisson uh, in goal. Um, and obviously that also aids the, the defenders, the obviously centre-backs, it aids obviously Van Dijk uh, and obviously the, the other guys um, to, to, to know that they've got a, a very competent and confident shot stopper behind them. Obviously, you know, if, if, if the ball does get past them, which it yeah. rarely does. What would you rate uh, his performance today out of 10? Alison, uh, it's funny, I, I, I'd probably rate him a little bit higher. Um, I'd probably rate him eight. I'd probably, I'd probably rate him seven. Well, no, yeah, I'd probably rate him somewhere between seven and eight. So we'll go with seven and a half. Yeah, so I'll be indecisive, and I'll say seven and a half. Seven and a half. Obviously, he did he made that good stop um, against Gray? Um, like you said, um, just looks confident and assured, and that will do for me. I mean, that that counts for me. That that gives gives him an extra extra score um, because you know it, it's so nice to actually watch Liverpool these days and not fear, you know, fear every time that opponents attack us. You know, yeah. it, it doesn't feel all that long ago, really. That well, it, well, it, it well, it isn't really, is it? Last season, you know, where teams would attack us, and you would fear, you would fear, basically, that we're going to concede a goal. Yeah. Um, and he's he's very commanding. He, he is liable still to the odd lapse in concentration, the the sort of bit of showboating. Um, you know, sort of when sometimes safety is almost the best policy, just to sort of clear the ball. Um, it, so he can be a little bit lackadaisical. Um, in, in possession every now and again, but uh, yeah. but no, it's, it's fantastic, terrific addition. So yeah, seven and a half. Shall we skip uh, Trent since he's probably a ten? Trent's ten. <laughs> Trent's a ten. Yeah, man of the match. Van Dijk for me. A 10. <laughs> you think you say Van Dijk? Yeah, he's probably yeah. a nine ten. Oh yeah, nine ten. Nine, ten, yeah, nine, nine or ten. I'd, I'd, I'd possibly, to be honest, I'd, I'd, I'll go with Trent and Van Dyke. Ten. Yeah, uh, my tip I'll say probably a seven. I'd, uh, I'd agree with that. I'd say seven. Seven's fair. Um, growing, growing in. I'd say to the role. Obviously, we know we know that obviously Joel Matip is a, is a competent and capable defender, but obviously he's and and of course he hadn't had you know, a, a long period of time 
you know, in, in the starting eleven, obviously until Joe Gomez's injury and then obviously Dejan Lovren's injuries and uh, and so forth. So obviously he, he hasn't. It's not like he's obviously been in a settled back four all season, but I do think yeah. personally that he's sort of grown into the role. Um, you know that, he, that there's a good partnership now, a good understanding between Matip and Van Dijk. Um, obviously it's our central pairing. Um, so so personally I, I feel again like the back five are much more watertight than they sort of you know than our defence has been over the last few weeks. Yeah, I've sort of I've sort of questioned Klopp about his you know the centre back position because I don't see how he's picked you know in the past uh, Lovren no. over Matip. No, nor do I. I don't like Lovren. <laughs> can't stand Lovren. I don't think anyone can. <laughs> no, no, they, they, they really can't. The thing is, I, I mean, Dejan Lovren, where do you start? You know, this is, I think he's, he's part and parcel of the Deadwood that we really, that we still need to shift on out of the club. Yeah. I think the biggest problem with Dejan Lovren is that he opens his mouth an awful lot, unfortunately. He's <laughs> very, very quick to give his nice interviews about, um, you know, basically being one of the best centre-backs in the world, one of the best defenders in the world. I think sort of during the World Cup, where he was sort of quite um, vocal about being such a fantastic defender. Yet he's very, very, very susceptible. Um, we we always look like we're going to concede when we've got Dejan Lovren in that back pair, uh, obviously in the, yeah. the centre-back pairing. Um, and I would put Dejan Lovren on a par. Mm, maybe that's a bit harsh, but... Um, <laughs> We'll you leave know, that for I, like. I'd put a line with Alberto Moreno. I want the pair of them gone. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll leave that for another episode, Albert on Moreno. Yeah, that, that, another episode because I I I, I won't stop. In, in, <laughs> yeah, it'll be a, like four hours long. <laughs> it will literally be about four hours long. Do a video recording on how to defend. Well, that yeah, that would be helpful. Hopefully, you know, I was going to say if we did a video on him. Uh, sort of on how to defend, we ought to put it to Dejan Lovren and get him to take note. <laughs> yeah. Take with Alberto Moreno as well, say, here's how to defend. Uh, what would you rate uh, Robertson? I might, this might be a little bit controversial. Um, Robertson, I, I would rate Robertson a six. The reason being, I feel personally that over the last few weeks unfortunately that Andy Robertson is obviously his his form has dipped slightly now I would say only a little bit his form's dipped a little bit um which is he's a great player this is the thing and Andy Robertson is an absolutely brilliant player I love Robo to bits he's a fantastic player um and the reason of the the reason why I'd, I'd rate him a six is because I didn't think he was as effective going forward as obviously as Trent was tonight. Now we know that Robertson, you know, we know that he is, he is very, very capable going forward as capable really as Trent. Yeah. He can deliver some fantastic crosses um, into the box. I think his crosses tonight were sort of near misses. They were sort of nearly crosses rather than accurate pimple uh, sort of, you know, pinpoint crosses that, yeah. that Trent delivered. Um, six, six, like I say, it might, might seem a little bit harsh, but Robbo, Obviously, like I say, he's, he's, he's fallen a little bit below his standards. But I think, and, and it's funny because I've seen quite a lot of abuse and quite a lot of criticism for him on Twitter again. Good old Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I do look at some of it and I just think, I, I'm not sure why people criticise him to the extent that they have done. I don't think it's warranted, uh, a lot of it. And I think a lot of it sort of is a, is a, is a bit unfair. He, he took quite a lot of stick against United. Um, and and I, I just I, I look at Robert and I think that the problem is because he performs generally at such a high standard. You think he's usually one of our very standout performers, I would say, uh, on a sort of weekly basis. You know, match day basis is 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 a great player. So I think if he falls just a little bit below those standards, people are quite quick to jump on him. But I would say over the course of the season, Robbo's been one of our most consistent performers. Yeah, uh, um, and everybody can have a dip in form, uh, but yeah. So I, I would say six, six, six yeah. might be a bit much, but I would say six. I'll probably give him a seven because he, I think he did do a good cross for. I think it was Van Dyke's second. Uh, 
I'm yes. not really sure. I'm not Van really Dijk. sure. Was it Van Dyke's first or second? I think it was his second. It was the second. I forgot. I I completely forgot about that. I was thinking more of the one that um, was the wayward for Mane, obviously earlier in the match. But uh, no, I I yeah, I stand corrected on that. I I'll, I, I don't often do it. I don't backtrack. I'll, I will amend my my uh, my score to seven then as well. Yeah. Seven, I, I actually forgot purely because I forgot that obviously it, it essentially assisted uh, Van Dyke second. Yeah, I do agree with you on the past with. Andrew Robertson's form dipping because I do remember I forgot the game I think it was against Leicester where I think we was oh no yeah we wasn't winning it was when we went down there half time he did a sort of pointless foul on the stroke yeah. of half time and Leicester crossed it in and scored from it yeah so we'll move on to the midfield okay we'll start with uh, uh, Mr Fab for Fabinho. being here. Good old Fab, I was going to say, he's an absolute beast. An absolute beast. I, I personally, personally speaking, um, I think he's going on or, or, or certainly sort of rising up in, in my rankings as, as possibly our top player. Um, and the reason for that is that he's, I, I, just, I just feel that he dominates, you know, he dominates our midfield. Um, and, and subsequently is, an, is is able to essentially dominate the match and dominate, you know, sort of the opposition midfield uh, as a result. Um, yeah. I think, to be honest, he's, he's the first answer that we've had to Javier Mascherano and obviously and uh, Xabi Alonso even, uh, sort of, you know, their absence and obviously them, them leaving Liverpool Football Club. Um, we haven't really had any... No disrespect to Lucas. I, I, I mean, I, I, I did like him. I did rate him, obviously, as a player. But um, he was never the defensive midfielder that sort of you shabby and your Javier uh, Mascherano were. Yeah. Um, and I think that Fabinho is, is possibly the closest to that uh, from what we've seen so far. Um, some of the tackles he put in tonight were, were just fantastic. And I think we're very much in danger these days, it seems, of football almost becoming a non-contact sport. Because players these days are almost seem more and more scared to tackle for the fear of players falling over, uh, you know, or going down like they've been shot. Um, but but Fabinho, he's, I, I just think he's, he's an absolute beast in that midfield. You yeah. know, puts in solid, crunching, you know, tackles. He lets opposition midfielders and players know that he's there. Uh, and he stands up and he's counted. And uh, I, I imagine that most sort of opposition players really know, you know, that, that, that they've been in a match when they've um, when they've come up against Fabinho. Um, certainly Watford tonight. Um, I, th I think that they will have they will have really known that he was there. They'll have felt his presence um, yeah. in that match. What would you give him like a match rating out of ten? I'd give him a nine. Nine. I'd give. I'd, I'd definitely give him a nine. Um, yeah, I'd give him a nine. What about yeah. you? I'll give him an eight. But I agree with you. He's been superb. Like he's I've, a player, isn't he? Yeah, he's he seems to slow down time and know where play whether players are going to dribble or pass the ball, and he's there. Yeah, he's he like is. he's like just a tall Kante in a sense. Yeah, he is. I would agree with that. He is. Yeah, definitely like a like a, a tall Kante. Um, like you say, he can he can dictate the the, the pace of the game. Uh, you know, he's he's uh, he is he's, he's a very very good player. And it's funny because Fabinho as well. You almost obviously he arrived at the same time as Keita, uh, and it's quite interesting. Again, sort of how quickly obviously one has adapted and how you know slowly the other has adapted and the the difference between the two couldn't be more marked really for yeah. for Mr. Now personally um you know I still it, it, it's slightly controversial but you know I sort of see Keita wearing the you know the legendary number eight shirt obviously yeah. of Steven Gerrard and I don't know I, I just think it's dreadful I think I, I, I think how on earth has he got the number eight shirt I think it's you know, obviously, we know that uh, about his talent, uh, and we know, obviously, you know, from obviously from his time at Leipzig, RB Leipzig. Um, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we we know obviously that he was a, a very very good player, but 
unfortunately, we haven't seen that yet. And it's not to say that obviously we won't. We've sort of seen glimpses. And I think that we will see the best of Naby. But yeah. right now, I am. I, I do sometimes sit there when he's when he's playing, and I just think, why the hell has he got the number eight shirt? Like this just is not right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a bit controversial. We'll move on to. Uh... Yeah, we're well, You start. Okay, um, we're now done. I'll keep it brief. Um, Wijnaldum, for me, is very much, what's the word, what could you describe him as? Just a workhorse. You know, he's not he's not the most flamboyant of players. He's not someone that sort of often stands out in the team as, as such for, you know, for his performance. But he's very consistent. And I think that's probably why. You know what I mean? He, he's he's never he's he's never sort of the first name that you can call, you know, as a sort of you know man of the match, brilliant, you know, brilliant, you know, brilliant performance, because he goes about his work, I think, quite quietly, you know, yeah. he's consistent. He's a he's a very 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 good player. I would actually go as far as saying that that for the majority of the season so far, um, he's possibly been our most consistent midfielder. Um, I would say and. Without him in the team, it is a big blow and it's a big loss for the team. Um, you know, um, so yeah, I, I would so I would rate Wijnaldum's performance tonight of an eight. Um, but yeah, I was going to say he's very much he's, he's one of these. He's um, like a dark horse, like a sort yeah. of a dark horse workhorse kind of uh, character. People always say, don't they? People always joke that they'd like a you know a team full of characters. And he almost reminds me of a character <laughs> in that sort of mould. You know what I mean? Yeah. That he's, he's a very big work, you know, workhorse and um, highly consistent, highly valuable member of the team. Yeah. What about you? I probably rate him a seven. Uh, I didn't notice much with him, but I can't say, you know, he played bad. That's like, me. That's literally what I thought. I thought I didn't really yeah. notice. <laughs> like, I can't give him any lower or, like, any higher. Sort of. No. He does a job. He does. That's the thing. He does a job. And I think when you notice, don't you, you, you always notice players, obviously, that do things wrong. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, I've referred to uh, Naby and obviously giving the ball away um, and things like that. You always notice players that do so much sort of wrong. Um, but sometimes when players are just very, very consistent, like when now done, um, you almost don't notice him because he's doing his work and obviously his teamwork so effectively, uh, you know, so you just sort of take it for granted, really. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to James Milner. OK. Uh, James Milner. OK, so James Milner. Um, obviously, I've, I've, I've already stated that um, I was quite shocked when I saw him in the team selection. Um, but... Oh, but that's almost it, it's almost an insult, really. When actually, when, when when you say that, because James Milner is, what can you describe him as, really? James Milner is is is, is again generally very much Mister Dependable. Obviously, he's had a couple of rough games deployed at right back um, yeah. to, to to account for our you know defensive injuries, defensive crisis. Um, obviously, he's not a right back by by trade. Um, so I think he's again he's also took quite a bit of stick for his performances at right back. Um, at the end of the day, he stands up and he's you know and he's and he's done a job for the team when he's been called upon to play right back. Mm. Um, James Milner, I thought I thought again he, he had a he had an okay performance. It, it, it was solid. I would say it was a solid. I, I would rate Milner personally a seven. Um, just solid again. It, James Milner for me is very much what you see is what you get. Um, you know, is is again his work ethic is exceptional. Um, you know, it's hard to believe he's actually mid thirties. Yeah. Um, mid thirties runs around again like he's cooking on gas. Um, <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Like you know, I, 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 I really do. James Milner's for me again. J James Milner's another one of those players where if you had a team of James Milner's, you know, you'd, you'd win everything. Um, yeah. Because you, you cannot fault him. No, I, 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 I'm not going to lie. I can't say I noticed him a huge amount, obviously, in the game. But at the same time, he didn't do anything wrong. So yeah. I believe so, he's the fittest player, you know. I do. 
Yeah, I remember a rumor. Uh, well, not a rumor, but a Kato came out and said um, when he started training with Liverpool, James Milner and I think it was Adam Milano were just like miles and miles ahead of him when they were doing jogging. I thought oh, he's, like, he's, 30, he's 35. <laughs> <laughs> it's remarkable, isn't it, really? Yeah. It is, it's remarkable. He's, he's a pro, isn't he? That's the thing. He's, he's such a such a pro, really, a consummate professional, really, an absolute professional. Um, very, very, he, I, he must do an awful lot of training or, or work very, very hard, you know yeah. what I mean, to, to maintain that sort of fitness level, especially over some of the younger guys. Yeah. We'll move on to the front three now. We'll start with uh, Sadio Mane. Okay. I'll start. Uh, I'll give Mane again a 10. We've, we've probably had probably him, Van Dijk and Trent were the three you could argue were all man of the match in this yep. game. Uh, his first goal uh, was a delightful cross from Trent. Neves headed it in. I, he's got a massive jump for a little guy. He <laughs> really has. It really yeah. has, but it's funny. Sometimes you can forget, can't you, just how small Sadio Mane is. I mean, he really is a, a, a very short guy, really. But for, for you know, for sort of in football in terms, especially, you know, he is a short, a short dude, a short guy. Um, yeah, yeah he's, he's got some power in his legs, hasn't he? Got some jump in his legs to get to get up to be able to to, to have the ball. Yeah, and his uh, second in, goal, where he just sent. Ben Foster for some crisp. Literally. After that back heel. <laughs> and what a poor first touch, though. When yeah. it was just that, that flipping, obviously watching it, obviously when you're watching it, obviously live, you see that first touch and you think, oh my God. Like I, I, I saw the first touch and I literally thought the chance was gone. You know yeah, I mean? In that split second, I thought because obviously because the ball went away from goal, obviously he had his back to goal, obviously the ball went away from goal. Um, and he sort of had to almost run back after, didn't he? Run, run obviously back after the ball. Yeah. But that finish, that that cheeky back heel finish, um, I think he's taken no luck to a to a new level. Yeah, he's um, what I like about him is even in recent weeks he's sort of been the replacement to Salah, who hasn't scored a lot of goals. I he think that's the been. first time in since I've been alive anyway, where we haven't just relied on you know like three four players. Like yeah. we have like seven, eight players who can supply on the day. I, I again, I totally agree with that, um, and and very much the same. I've I've grown up sort of used to Liverpool teams where you sort of thought goals were coming from two, three, four players at, at a push, um, and if goals didn't come from those players, we were not scoring. It was it was really quite that simple. Um, so it is. It's really really refreshing that we sort of have you know, goal outlets that, that seem to be generally really spread across the pitch. I mean, look at Van Dijk, you know, obviously scoring, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, himself. So, so you know, but we have goals generally, I think, spread quite nicely throughout the team. And Mane, I think, has really stepped up to the plate, like you said, it, given given sort of Salah um, sort of not being almost as, as effective from time to time. But I do think um, there's been quite a lot of criticism of Mo Salah um, actually, I'll leave most Alex because obviously yeah. we're going to him now, uh, aren't we? Or, 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 so, so yeah. But obviously, well, Mane, Mane, um, brilliant. He's, he's, he's obviously he's a brilliant player. Um, I think we're very lucky to have Sadio. Um, and I think sometimes he's uh, just a little bit underrated, uh, yeah. a little bit underrated really. Um, he's very, he's very much, uh, you know, a capable out and out goal scorer. Um, and I think it suits him better to be played through the middle, uh, yeah. personally. I think that this system tonight against Watford, with Mane through the middle and Salah on the right, is really the way forward, personally. Yeah. Next yeah. we'll do uh, Devon Karigi before Salah. OK, go on then. Devon Karigi, I'll give him... I'll give him a seven. Uh, we mentioned this before. Uh, about first half, he didn't really do much. And then second half, he... Beats three Watford players and scores. Whether you agree Watford's defenders were just switched off for the goal or not, he's got his goal, which he's actually, if 
it's quite funny because without him and Sturridge, like the goals they've scored, even though they haven't scored many, we'd be probably four points behind City because Origi scored the last minute goal against Everton. That's right, and Sturridge scored obviously that late equaliser against uh, Chelsea. Yeah. As well, so that obviously that also was a point. So yeah, so that is four. Yeah, so obviously you think that's the the four points that essentially we could also have less. You know, obviously than we've yeah. got obviously in the table. Um, and we'll move on. Uh, what would you rate uh, Rigi out ten? Uh, to be honest, there's not really much more for me to add. Um, that I think than than the you than the sort of hasn't been said by yourself already. Um, I, again, I would um, rate Rigi a seven. Um, like you say, sort of had three three Watford players around him, sort of neat right foot finish. Um, played okay, Origi. Obviously, he looked a little bit rusty in the first half, but I think that's to be entirely expected. He doesn't get an awful lot of game time. Um, he, you know, I think he had a, a, a solid performance, essentially, as a stand-in today. Um, and I was pleased for him that, that, that he got the goal. Um, yeah. I think, like you say, sort of some of it, is, is it on Watford, you know, and their defenders? Sort of, did they just sort of back off or, or you know, sort of ease off a, a little bit? But then I think at 2 0, the sort of Watford are still in the game, uh, essentially. Sort of that third goal kills the game, really. So, um, so yeah, it could have been a case of obviously Watford, um, you know, sort of defenders lapsing, Origi being brilliant, or sort of a mix of the two. But yeah. A seven, seven definitely. I think it's yeah. fair enough for Rigi. Well so played. Last on the starting eleven, we have Mohamed Salah. Okay. What would you rate him today? It's funny, Mo Salah. Um, I would rate him a nine. Obviously, he didn't score, and that, that might seem a little bit high. He didn't score, um, but I think he was fantastic tonight. Um, thoroughly unplayable really, at, at points, well, you could say really virtually throughout the match. Um, some of the runs that he made, I think that run that he made for the second, is it the second goal? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it was, weren't it? The run that he made for that second goal for, for Mane was brilliant. Obviously, he had the cross, of course, from Trent. But no, Salah gave um, Watford's left-back. Uh, it just really bugs me that I can't the left, me think of his name. And, Messina, uh, was it? Was it who, sorry? Uh, Adam Mazina, I think it was. Mazina, that's it, Mazina. That's it, you're right there. Uh, Mazina, thank you. Uh, Salah, Salah, well, Salah totally gave uh, Mazina the runaround, really. Um, absolutely ran him ragged throughout the throughout the match. And personally speaking, um, I've sort of touched on it already, so I might sound a bit like a broken record. But um, for me, Mo Salah is most effective when he's played on the right-hand side. Um you know, Mane, obviously, very, very good through the middle. But I just feel like Salah looks an awful lot more effective on the right-hand side than he does through the middle. Now, yeah. there could be a number of reasons for that. Of course, naturally, if you're playing through the centre, you are coming face-to-face, -face, obviously, with the two centre-backs. When you're playing on the right-hand side, obviously, you're coming up against the opposition's left-back. So, obviously, essentially... Yeah. Unless obviously they double up, unless the you know in their within their tactics of the opposition they decide to double up on yeah. the on the right hand side, which they do anyway, uh, more often than not. I think you've got more space to exploit, obviously from width. And Mo Salah, I, I think it's just something that he thrives off, and he's very good at cutting inside anyway, obviously off that right wing uh, to yeah. to come inside. And I just thought he looked a lot more potent, a lot more threatening. I would like personally um, moving forward, certainly against Everton and then obviously the return leg of, of, of Bayern Munich um, to see Salah on that right-hand side and not through the middle, personally. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would rate Mo a, a nine. Uh, I think it was an absolute nuisance for Watford all night. Um, absolute, you know, absolutely fantastic uh, player, of course. Um, took a lot of criticism for some of his performances against the so-called big teams. People have been saying that he's sort of been going missing uh, against the top yeah. team, the big teams. And I think that's just very unfair. Um, yeah. We'll talk know, about this on a, another episode because we can also talk about the sort of diving situation people's been talking about. Yeah, definitely. I agree. We could, yeah, we, we, can, we could sort of approach this subject, can't we, on, on another episode. And obviously if anybody has any ideas or 
any suggestions that they that they want to sort of raise in to do with Mo Salah and diving and um, form against the so-called big six or you know and you know top teams and and, and so forth. Then um, people should basically just comment really or, or or leave their own suggestions for us to yeah. debate. Shall we Thanks. do the substitute players? Yeah, sure. Uh, just very quickly, what's your uh, your rating for Sa- uh, Mo? I'm going to rate him an eight. I think he's he's vital for when we play teams like Watford, who's going to be yeah. more defensive. Because, like you said, they have to double up on him. If they don't double up on him, he will beat the fullback, no matter who it is. Yeah. And he creates space, and sometimes it's not even noticed. Like he'll drag a lot of defenders out from the runs he's make simply because they know he's a threat. Exactly. Exactly, and then it creates more space in the middle. Yeah, so I rate him in uh, eight. Uh, okay. The f- first sub we'll talk about is Nabi uh, Kaita. He only had six minutes, so I don't know if yeah. we should do him since he didn't have much. He had minimal impact, didn't he, really? Minimal impact on the game, not enough time really to make a, a serious impact. Um, yeah, it's difficult to really rate into. Yeah, uh, Adam Lallana also had twelve minutes. He did, so that was only sort of a, a, again a brief amount of time. Yeah, and Henderson had well, he had twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Would he you, did. So, Henderson, go on. I'll let you let you stand. He did all right when he came on, but the game was pretty much dead and buried when it he came good. on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I would agree with you entirely. Um, the game was basically won, um, obviously at three nil. Um, Henderson, Henderson, Henderson um, has obviously taken a lot of criticism, a lot of flack, um, a lot of nasty. I always see a lot, a lot of nasty stuff on Twitter about Henderson, uh, about the fact that he should be nowhere near the team about the fact that all he does is passes backwards, about the fact that he should not be our captain and that Van Dijk should be our captain. Um, I, I have big issues, really, with an awful lot of it. And unfortunately, it's it's not, believe it or not, um, sort of the minority that seem to be saying this. It does seem to be quite a common theme, um, sort of trawling through it all on Twitter. People furious that when Henderson gets named in the starting eleven. um furious every time he passes the ball backwards. Um, I I take note particularly of Henderson's performance against Bayern Munich in which I thought he was absolutely outstanding. Jordan Henderson has has been a very, very consistent player for Liverpool for a long, long time. He is the captain of the football club and I personally respect that. Um, I find it very, very difficult when when I sort of read all of the abuse um, sort of people saying, oh, if we if we win the Premier League, if we win the title, you know, why on earth is Henderson picking it up? Why will why will he be picking the trophy up? Or he should not be picking it up. You know, Van Dijk should be picking it up. Well, actually, no, I, I and I and I thoroughly disagree. I think that Henderson is a very very consistent, very reliable, dependable player. Um, obviously, we've got more competition now uh, in midfield, but that's healthy. Obviously, at, at a club. Obviously, of Liverpool's size, of our size, that that's what you expect. Um, I know that obviously was a little bit frustrated to be taken off against United. I didn't see any any wrongdoing in that. That's just, you know, that's what you expect. He, he's passionate. He cares. Yeah. You know, he was frustrated. You, it was sort of keeper from uh, yeah. from Chelsea. <laughs> to, you know, uh, crazy, crazy. No, I, I, you know, don't don't you dare take me off. It wasn't none of that. Standing there refusing. To come off the pitch so uh, he was just frustrated obviously in in such a big game obviously to be taken off and that that, that's fine for me Um, I didn't see an issue with it personally Um, he's human like like anybody else Uh, but yeah Henderson like I said I don't know what your thoughts are but um, like I say he he takes a lot of criticism but I, I just feel like Henderson is is yeah, he, he does pass sideways quite a bit. He does pass backwards quite a bit. Yeah. But I'd almost rather that... Not not that obviously I want our attacks to be stifled or I want our attacks to be slow. But sometimes 
I know sometimes maybe he's guilty of still passing it sideways and backwards when he's not under pressure. But yeah. in general, I like to see us maintain possession. So I would rather that actually he take the safe pass than do a Nabikita, get dis, you know get dispossessed, and essentially we're facing our own goal. So yeah. I think sometimes there's a fine balance between you know defence and attack, and between safety and recklessness. And I think sometimes Jordan Henderson probably does verge too much on the side of safety, but at the same time, he's not a reckless player, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so, which which I like. I like to watch a game, you know, and to actually feel comfortable watching us in possession. I don't like to sort of, you know, to, to watch those sort of nitty bitty matches where it's constant, can't string two and three and four passes together. And I think that Jordan Henderson is, is one of those that's very, very good. He has a very high pass completion rate, a very consistent one um, whenever he plays. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so Jordan Henderson, personally, I think, is, he, he, like I say, gets a lot of unwarranted, unfair criticism. But then yeah. uh, plenty of people argue otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually in this similar situation to you. I think he's really passionate about Liverpool. I do. I remember back when, uh, this is a few years ago when Gerard still played for us. I remember when Gerard was on the wing and it was like the 90th minute, we were winning by a goal and he shot. Like, it was a ridiculous shot. I seen Henderson, you know, shout at him. And I thought yeah. that takes some balls to shout <laughs> at Steven Gerrard. Like, it does. And you can tell when he got subbed off against United, he was passionate, he wanted to play. And that yeah. sort of hunger to want to play for the club, it sort of... We missed it a lot. We do. Especially when Carragher and Gerrard left. A lot of players during that time, they either they just wasn't good enough. Or I don't think they tried. Players like, you know, Joe Allen... Uh, who else? Uh, the odd games with Emre Can. Yeah, I like how he was disciplined for the, you know, when he was obvious he was leaving for Juventus, and he still did his job. But yeah, I think but in general loyalty, loyalty is a difficult is 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 a difficult one, isn't it? To sort of to say. Uh, you know, these days in, in sort of Premier League clubs or, or in general in, in, in sort of club football uh, across the world. Um, player loyalty seems to extend these days as far as the, the highest paycheck, um, you know, and, w- and which club sort of offers the most money. Uh, a lot of players will obviously will, will quickly up and run. They'll ditch you. Um, you know, for, all, for, for example, Fernando Torres was obviously a great player for Liverpool. He had absolutely no sense of loyalty whatsoever. Um, and was very, very quick to up and to leave to Chelsea. Uh, the grass was certainly no greener at Chelsea for yeah, him. I'm going to be honest, I cried when he left. Oh, I, w- I was gutted. I was, genuinely, I was gutted. And then even more gutted when Andy Carroll came in. <laughs> I thought it was like a hell. I literally, I, I, I thought that day, I, I, I thought it was like worst, all my worst nightmares come true. I thought, what is this? Like, I can remember yeah. that. Obviously, I trusted, of course, Kenny Dalgleish. But, um, you know, I, I thought, Jesus, you know, we, we've, we've lost Fernando Torres and we've signed this donkey. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> what? Like, where's the 30 goals? You know, he's not going to get us 20, 30 goals a season. You know, I was thinking, you know, where are our goals? But yeah. uh, no, I did. I, I was gutted when, when Torres left. But we, what, what you said, obviously, about Henderson, that passion, that loyalty, that I, that I think he has for Liverpool Football Club, um, that that you know for me that that almost that means more than actual talent a lot of the time yeah. because you know the lad wants to play for us you know he, he, you can tell obviously how much it means to him and I, I I don't know I just find it really really frustrating seeing people constantly sl- you know slating him and uh, and basically saying that he's not worthy of being at the football club well actually he is. And he is a, you know, he is a very good player. I mean, perhaps yeah. he's not one of these players that's, you know, going to, you know, maybe get get in or get you the best side, the very best side in the world. But 
he is a you know he is still a very very good player and I think he's still one of our better midfielders despite yeah. what some people like to think. A lot of people are like that. Oh, we should get rid of Henderson. But if yeah. you if you go back, if you remember, we paid was it twenty million for him from Sunderland, yeah. yeah. And right now, if you was to sell him, you wouldn't get anyone for the value you'd sell him for because I yeah. I personally think if you compare him as a holding midfielder, if yeah. the other top six sides, yeah, I think he'd get over Tottenham over Eric Dyer. Yeah, I do. Oh God, he's a lot. Yeah, I, I rate him much more highly than Eric Dyer. And yeah. anybody, I mean, I, I personally, I'll be controversial as well, and I will say any Liverpool fan that doesn't agree with that or doesn't agree with that, the, the idea that Jordan Henderson um, is a much better holding midfielder than Eric Dyer, um, I think probably needs their heads looking at, or they're very, very biased because yeah. Jordan Henderson is a much better player than than, than Eric Dyer. Yeah. yeah, it's the way. He wins the ball, he recycles it, he won't get you 20 goals a season or no. probably sell up 20 goals a season. He's disciplined oh, in the way Gerard. he plays. Exactly, exactly. And I was going to say, and he's, he's obviously he's never going to be Gerard. You know, he's not that sort of, you know, a, attacking midfielder in the way that obviously Gerard was obviously bagging you, obviously goals, you know, 10, 20 goals a season. Um, Jordan Henderson's a very different type of player. Uh, in his own right. And I think a lot of Liverpool fans almost got caught up in the idea that Jordan Henderson was almost a replacement, you know, uh, like a young replacement, obviously played alongside Gerard, but would ultimately be his replacement. Um, yeah. And it's never really been that way. That's not been Jordan Henderson throughout his career at Sunderland or with, with Liverpool. Um, you know, obviously he can score a goal, but he's never going to bag a load of goals. But obviously goals aren't everything um, from from obviously Jordan Henderson, given obviously the rest of the contributions that he does make to the team. Um, and of course, the fact that we've got goals running through the team anyway sort of makes it less of an issue. We had a, a, an over-reliance on Steven Gerrard, of course, to yeah. drag him through so many games, um, you know, with big goals um, that obviously we would not get from Jordan Henderson if, if if, you know, if it was a similar scenario now with with obviously, but with with strikers that were unable to score, so yeah. um, then we would be you know struggling. Yeah, it's either to replace someone like Gerard. It's not one player you buy. You've got to buy about five players. Yeah, you have. You he's a player. Yeah, you can't replace the set pieces he took. No. His range of passing, his range of shooting, his penalties as well. He's like funny. 9 out of 10 out of everything. It, it was, it was. And it's funny, it's Stephen Gerrard. It, it's one of those where actually almost, when I think of it like that, that obviously, of course, Stephen Gerrard, obviously, um, obviously managing, obviously, Rangers now, uh, obviously no longer playing for us. Um, I almost, I never really even wanted, you know, to sort of t- to see the day where he would retire or, or, or to sort of, you know, no longer play for Liverpool. And I could never, at the time when obviously he, you know, obviously he left under, under Brendan Rodgers, I, I never really found myself up until that point able to see a light, a sort of, you know, a, a Liverpool team without him. Um, yeah. I wasn't able to sort of see a way forward really for the team without him. Um, and actually, I think it's real credit almost to Jurgen Klopp since, you you know, to think what a team we now have, um, you know, the balance that we've got throughout the team. You know, we've got a very, very, very good team um, and, and probably a much stronger team than Gerard was ever able really to play in, in general, yeah. by and large. And it's a shame. It's a shame, obviously, for Stephen, for, for Stephen Gerrard, um, because obviously he never obviously got to win the title. But um, you know, it, it, I, I just think it amazes me really that that we do have such a strong, you know, fantastic team that I, you know, a few years ago could never have foresaw. Um, especially once Steven Gerrard left, it, to me it was like the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's credit really that to, to Jurgen Klopp that he's been able to build such a balanced, successful, you know, successful free flowing side. So we do have a good problem with the midfield dilemma and also with Chamberlain coming back. 
Uh, it's going to give Klopp a massive headache. We'll also be doing the Everton preview. That should be up quite soon. Before the Everton game, obviously. Uh, yes, so like the page. Uh, subscribe. Uh, follow us on Twitter, although we're more active on Facebook. Would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, basically just... just want to quickly ask people to give their thoughts obviously this is our first podcast um what did you sort of like about it what didn't you like about it any any sort of constructive uh, of course constructive criticism uh, is is uh, very very welcome um yeah basically obviously uh, just just also to add obviously this uh, the, the midfield dilemma of course that's going to give uh, Jurgen Klopp a headache is obviously a very good headache for for him to have i mean it's not a bad one um lots of options lots of uh, possibilities um in that midfield three um, that's been quite difficult to predict throughout the season anyway um in terms of a sort of a consistent midfield three so it's just just more options for him so i, I, I you know, uh, it can only be a good thing, really. Um, and as Lee said, um, the Everton preview will be up before the Merseyside derby, which, of course, takes place on Sunday afternoon. Um, so hopefully we'll win that one. We need to give it uh, give it our all uh, to win it. Thank you for listening. Um, and we'll speak, well, we'll record more soon. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.